Ever since Clarence Larkin brought to us the doctrine of dispensationalism, we have been uh, on assault. There's been an assault on the words of Jesus Christ. So to the point now where it's very normative to just simply say Paul is the only apostle. I mean, and, and basically we don't get any guidance from Jesus any longer in the, in the Gospels. So I've collected a few of the examples here from leading voices or influential voices, and we'll go through them all here. This is a, a, some of them, and some of them are older in time, and we're going to just show you uh, some of them. And then some of them are people who've written, and you just, you need to hear it to then pre prepare yourself, brace yourself. How are you going to respond to the people who are like so deep in the woods with uh, Paulinism, I call it. And it's it goes under the name of dispensationalism, but it's really back to Marcion. It's back to this whole idea that Jesus didn't come with the gospel. He only came to that a gospel could be preached. That was actually uh, the, the message of Billy Graham. <laughs> so we're going to show you that is wrong. Jesus came with the gospel and Paul came with a contrary gospel. And you're going to see how contrary it is. They can't keep them together. They have to. They have to say Jesus' words don't apply because they know they contradict Paul. That's what, what's go really going on here. All right, so let's uh, begin. And I'm just going to take a quick break. All right, so let's start with Richard Jordan, president of Grace School of the Bible. Now we have a video, but we only had a short uh, clip of his, so we're going to read more of that uh, video. We, we had for you, and you can see the whole video at, at the link that you can get through this web page itself. In the following uh, YouTube video entitled Christian Prayer, How to Pray to God. So to me, this is just like the ultimate insult. I, I wanted to go find a, a, a web article, a web video on how to pray better, right? Don't, don't we all want to learn how to pray better? Well, instead of being about prayer, he just hijacks the whole thing after two minutes about prayer, and then he just turns it all into dispensational doctrine, and now it's just going to be unbelievable. And and he didn't know who, <laughs> he didn't anticipate I was going to see this thing and publicize it. I found this video on April 27, 2016, simply by accident. I was trying to learn how to pray better. I chose this video with no purpose to find yet another extraordinary and shocking example of Paulinism. Richard Jordan, beginning at 4.57 minutes into the video, says most churches teach things that, quote, have nothing to do with the dispensation of grace that applies today. Most teach Jesus' words in his earthly ministry when Jordan says this is an error for those words of Jesus supposedly have no validity today. Only Paul's words are valid today. The reason I'm not using his video is it'll take too long because he just has all these digressions. I, I, I like to use ellipses to get rid of the stuff that is unnecessary. So here's what he says. When you go back to the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, where he is proclaiming what he calls the gospel of the kingdom, Jesus then dies, is crucified and resurrected, and then the Holy Spirit comes in the book of Acts, and then at minute 601, when you go back into these books, back here, underscoring with chalk on a board, the four gospels, so he's put out Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, so he's talking about the four gospels, and then he says, and you try to go back there and get your prayer promises and your prayer instructions, you're going to have a problem because the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where Christ is preaching the kingdom has nothing to do though with you. Those are instructions that have nothing to do with what God is doing today in the dispensation of the grace of God. If you relax a minute and don't blow a gasket, just take a minute and relax. Take a deep breath. He knows he's telling you something shocking, right? I know what I'm going to say to some people is shocking, is jarring. But I just challenge you. Look at Romans 15, verse 8. Quote, now I say Christ was a minister of the circumcision. End of quote. So here is back in his ministry in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And he, Paul, says he is a minister of the circumcision to, com to confirm the truth of God, to confirm the promises to the fathers. These are promises God made to the nation of Israel. And Jesus came in his earthly ministry to do what? He came to confirm those promises. You see, the message that Jesus Christ is preaching about this coming over here, meaning the, the later time in the time timeline, setting up a kingdom, delivering the nation of Israel from the wrath of God in the tribulation period. So he's trying to say Jesus is talking about the people who will be saved in a tribulation. <laughs> not not anything now, not, not any reform or change in behavior now when when they come when the tribulation happens is when they'll have to change their behavior in matthew 4 verse 23 jesus is preaching the gospel of the kingdom 
What you have back here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is you have a Jewish Messiah preaching a Jewish message to the nation of Israel about the kingdom that is coming. He is Israel's Messiah. He has come as the minister of Israel, and he is preaching about Israel's coming kingdom. Jesus told his disciples that he was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. It doesn't mean God does not care about the Gentiles. It just meant the salvation of God would go through Israel down here to the Gentiles. The blessing of God is going to go to the Gentiles out here, meaning the time when we are in the tribulation with the Antichrist. Uh, right. When we're having the tribulation with the Antichrist, that's when we're all going to need, and you know, that's when we're going to have to change and behave right. Now we don't have to do that. I'm adding this here. What he's really saying is you don't have to conform to Jesus's message until this, uh, the, the, the judgment of this world happens, and then we all be, are going to be put in what's called the kingdom, and then you have to learn and obey Jesus. But now, now it's just all optional. It's just just not even optional. He's saying you're going the wrong direction. But I digress. Let's keep going. And then he says, in order for Gentiles to get it, Israel has to be converted. Quote, all Israel be saved, as is written by Paul. That's what prophecy is about. That is what the kingdom program is about. The books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are about that issue. So he's trying to say this is not the current issue we're dealing with today. He's talking about a kingdom to come that's in another place. The problem he has, what's the problem? Jesus said, I am a king already, that he'd already received the kingdom when he was here. So he is our king right now. King Jesus is your king. He's not going to be only a king in the future. He is now king. And therefore his commands apply now. But see, dispensationalists cut him up. So he, he can't even function. He has no function as a king until later. So you can do all your disobeying now. You can have a live a life of faith alone, easy peasy stuff. And that's exactly what Jesus wants you to have. No, no burdens, no, no problems, no, no laws, no, nothing. That's, that's supposedly what Jesus really wants from you. <laughs> okay, let's go back to what he says. The message you hear today of most churches, most preaching you hear today is really the kingdom gospel, the kingdom commission, the kingdom signs, the kingdom laws, the kingdom principles, and the kingdom promises. And when you go back here and try to take those Jewish kingdom promises and put them on us today where Christ in heaven has been revealed through Apostle Paul, a new ministry for the church, the body of Christ. This was kept a secret. Now, that's going to come up over and over again. This was a secret. These people, meaning, and then he points to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, their gospels, did not know about it back here. He's saying that the, the apostles did not know there was a secret. There's going to be a secret message, and this is going to be over and over again. So just so you know, the early church called this mystery religions and Gnosticism, basically, so, so that, that the Instead of it being a truth that could be easily proclaimed and understood, it was a mystery and a secret. And just this, this little cult over here could believe it. And by the way, this is what really creates cults. If you can get people to think that we have a secret that nobody else knows, that it's just, you know, God imparted it to us like we're some beneficial, you know, whatever. Like just what just to, just so you know, is you have to dig and, and, and do this kind of machinations with your mind to come up with this kind of gobbledygook, right? <laughs> That's what it is. When we preach Jesus' words only, we're just preaching what Jesus teaches. There's no secret. It's what he said. So we don't have a cult where we're, we're talking about, hey, you have some secret knowledge and it's been hidden from people. No, that's not how we approach the Bible. We're saying this is really pretty obvious, right? But they think it's a secret. Paul's coming with this secret gospel and, and he's, it's got to be kept hidden. But that's what he says. This is how he says. And it's not alone. You're going to see this over and over again. I have other examples of this from scholars, from people you might think are more reputable to not say something as crazy as that. Anyway, so they, meaning Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, did not know about it back here. He doesn't reveal it until you come to the ministry of Paul. Ah, so Paul gets the ministry. The secret comes to Paul. Now think of how crazy that is, ladies and gentlemen. So Jesus does picks a guy who's committed blasphemy and murder. That's a perfect person to pick, someone who has committed the unpardonable sin and also has killed and murdered people and is subject to the death penalty. You're going to pick him to give the secret of the kingdom and not maybe like Peter or John, gospel, the, the, the apostle that Jesus loved. Why would you tell him? Why would you tell some guy who's a murderer and a blasphemer? It just doesn't make any sense. But it, hey, that's what he says. He doesn't reveal it until you come to the ministry of Paul, the body of Christ where there is no Jew or Gentile. So basically, he's gotten rid of the Abrahamic covenant too. Paul said there's no Jew or Gentile. If there's no Jew, there's no more Abrahamic covenant to enforce because the only people who were bound to it were the Jews, the sons of Israel in, in Genesis 17. But we are one in Christ. 
See, so the word Christ is now being used to just make you assent. This is now you're being told this is coming from Christ instead of it's just coming from a guy named Paul who's a blasphemer and a murderer. Okay. When you get over here, Paul's ministry, and you go back there, i.e. back to Jesus' earthly ministry, and take that information, i.e. Jesus' teachings, and put it over here, well, that's when you must be rightly dividing the word of truth. This is one of the favorite sayings of the uh, dispensational people because they ha they see a double entendre. They always say, Paul says, you must rightly divide the truth. Well, what they believe is the gospel is divided in two, the one of Jesus, which is dead and gone, and the one of Paul, which is the only gospel to follow at this time. So, uh, so he says, uh, you must be rightly dividing the word of truth. If you don't make that distinction that God makes, you are going to end up with heartache and ruin. Heartache and ruin if you follow Jesus. Oh my gosh, why did Jesus give us such a gospel that would cause heartache and ruin? You're going to try to talk to God on a basis that he is not talking to you. See, now, that the opposite is true. They're talking to a God who isn't even thinking anything like them. They're all about faith alone and secrets and, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John are irrelevant. And, you know, we live in a different dispensation. These people are living in a fantasy world that they don't see it. They're, they're locked in it. They are actually in, they are the ones in the cult. Anybody starts talking about secrets and Paul's the only one who gets a secret. There's no reason that Jesus couldn't talk to the 12 or the 11, whoever many were still alive. See, this is, this is the nonsense. You've got to process things logically. If Paul was truly from Jesus, then Jesus would have said the same thing to the 12 and, and, and they would be preaching the same gospel, but they're not. He wouldn't recruit them and then say, oh, you know, uh, your, your mission's over with or your mission isn't as important as this other mission and I can't even recruit you for that. And we know that isn't what happened because actually Peter says what? After the Acts 10 experience where Cornelius is called as a Gentile and Peter's to minister to him and he, he teaches him about Jesus and, and brings it, makes him a Christian, then Peter is called what? The, he says in Acts 15, he says, the Holy Spirit long ago made me an apostle of the Gentiles. Okay, so let's keep going. So, so if you have this idea of going back to Jesus' gospel, you are trying to talk to God on a basis that he is not talking to you. False, 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 false. And, and again, I mean, it's just insulting of Jesus, but it, 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 but Jesus is the prophet. That's in Acts 3, verse 21 to 23. That means every, in Deuteronomy 18, 16 to 19, God said, when the prophet comes, you must obey every word he speaks, and I will hold every man accountable to that, uh, the, that prophet. But here's what Mr. Jordan is saying. You got to get in your book and rightly divide your book so you can see that God, what God's do, God is doing today and the dispensation of grace is found in the book of Romans to Philemon. That's where we are today in the dispensation of grace. If you claim promises back over here, and then he points over to Jesus' earthly ministry on his chart, they are going to just be a burden, a burden. Jesus said, my burden is light, but Mr. Jordan said it's heavy and it's it's just heartache and ruin. All right, just, to, I mean, this is, this is just a, Perfect example of the con artists that play this game and, and it's bait and switch. They get you with Jesus, they get you with a prayer. And then after you say, I love Jesus, I, I you know, I want to pray. They're going to now switch it all around and say, well, you got to get your real message, your marching orders from a guy named Paul. And it, it won't make sense, but you're supposed to believe it because it's a secret. It's a secret. And let's go to Petting Hill and, and Tory. Now, these are two uh, evangelical scholars, right? They write that Jesus' gospel is not to be taught until the tribulation. Same thing as Mr. Jordan. For now, we are only to teach what Paul taught, a gospel of grace. Here's a quote from their book, very mainstream. 1001 Bible Questions Answered, Inspirational Press, 1997 at 120. And let me just say this to you. This is a lot like you want to learn prayer. You think you're coming here just to get questions answered in an objective, you know, like I need my basic Bible information. No, they're going to skew you to the same way Mr. Jordan's doing. They have to try to appear like they're just teaching Christ, right? And and then when you they rope you in, they suck you in, then they're going to teach you Paul. See, when you come here to learn about Jesus, we teach you Jesus. We teach you his words, because and we put it right in our name. So we promise you that you can only hear his words. I mean, of course, we have to talk about Paul because he's on the other side, and we have to try to help people who are trapped by that doctrine of Paul and get them to follow Jesus, hopefully, in the end. But here, here's what he says. We're convinced that this, i.e., the belief that the church was commissioned to preach the gospel of the kingdom, is an error. 
It would be a strange thing to find the church's commission in the kingdom gospel. So that's the same thing that Mr. Uh, Jordan was saying is Jesus was coming about preaching a kingdom of how we would live in the kingdom and so on and so forth. But Jesus said, I'm a king now. So he didn't say it was coming in the future. There'll be a, a, a kingdom uh, reign in the new Jerusalem. That's true. But he is still our king because a king doesn't need a building, a structure. It, and in fact, this is sort of our school. This is where we are learning. And if we're not ready and not uh, obeying him now, w why would he pick us for the future? So, so this is nonsense that you can just become a Christian, disobey Jesus, and wait for your death that you'll then finally obey Jesus when you are resurrected. It ain't going to work that way. And it makes no sense. Crazy, crazy. This is a crazy doctrine. But this is the, this is the majority doctrine. This is the overwhelming majority doctrine. Anyway, they continue here. I have long been convinced and have taught that the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19 to 20 is primarily applicable to the kingdom rather than to the church, meaning this future time when Jesus comes back. If this were kept in mind, we should not fall into confusion regarding our marching orders, which are found in Acts 1, verse 8, with details in the epistles to the churches. The Matthew Commission, i.e. the commission to preach Jesus' commands, will come into force for the Jewish remnant after the church is caught away. And by the way, so that doesn't even apply to us later. It's just going to be for the Jewish remnant. It's going to be in this tribulation period. They're going to be expected to obey Christ in the tribulation period. And that's how the Jews get saved, but a very brief period of time. So, so, so just so you understand, they don't really believe even the, the, the principles of Jesus will apply in the kingdom then. So they're very, it's very mysterious how they do this, is they've got special doctrines and cut-ups. So the cutout is the cutout is the kingdom will be this short period, you know, when the Antichrist is coming and the Jews are going to be recruited. We won't even be here. I mean, so so we're never going to have to subject ourselves to Jesus' principles. That's how they teach it. So, but anyway, let's continue. But it gets worse, I say. Quote, this is from page 113. I had this book, I read this book, and I was I kept getting shocked reading it over and over, like, uh, Mark's gospel, he says, like Matthew. Mike Matthews and Luke's is primarily a kingdom book. So again, it's not relevant now. And I am satisfied that none of them contains the church's marching orders. And it's the same expression that Mr. Jordan used. See, the, 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 these people echo each other. It's an echo chamber. They live in an echo chamber. Not even the so-called Great Commission of Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. To be, to be sure, we are to preach the gospel to every creature. But what gospel? The only gospel known to the synoptics was the gospel of the kingdom. Our gospel of the kingdom, i.e., one that matches what he, the one that he, meaning these authors, think matches Paul, quote, end of end of my bracket, is found among the four evangelists only in John. And so, again, we're having a series. We're going to show you. We've, we're showing already. We've done numerous episodes. Is it is a myth, and we destroy this myth that the book of John is a a what they would call a kingdom gospel because it uses the word believe, 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 believe. And it isn't. It's obey, 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 obey. And that's the true Greek. And we're showing and exposing that every day. Uh, we're doing a little verse a, a day. So uh, so they always carve out John. Ah, John we like. Well, wait till they don't like John. So now suddenly, because the word will change to obey, and it must change because that's the actual meaning is, uh, you know, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever obeys unto him should have eternal life. That's what it actually says in John 3.16. Very well known. The NIV Theological Dictionary made that clear uh, in 2000, 2001. And page two, tw 1027, under the definition of pistis, they went into the way to translate pistoo in John in, in everywhere in the New Testament. Okay, uh, let me wrap up this one, and then I'm going to take a break at, on uh, when we get to Zwingli. They mean John supposedly speaks of Paul's faith alone gospel in a few verses, and those apply today, but all the faith plus works and follow the law teachings of Jesus are supposedly effective only in the future during the tribulation, this, this short period of time, and then that's it. <laughs> and then you're going to be in the kingdom. It's just, well, the, the Jerusalem, the uh, city of Jerusalem. Incidentally, and, and I guess, you know what I go through here is they're wrong about what John's gospel is really all about. It's all about obedience because that word so was mistranslated over 30 times to be believe, 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 and it isn't, it isn't, it isn't. <laughs> okay, we'll take a break right now and we'll come right back. Okay, so let's look at this guy's wingly. This is from the 1520s. 
Uh, in the Reformation, Zwingli believed Paul's epistles supplanted any need to focus on the words of Jesus Christ. Quote, Zwingli's copy of the New Testament was confined to Paul's epistles and Hebrews. Schaff, Creeds of Christendom, Volume 1, Section 51. So I always laugh when people say to me, oh, the Jesus word's only principle. You're getting rid of half of the New Testament. I said, you guys have already gotten rid of the first half. What, what's more important, the first or the second half? Ah, they go crazy. Now, next is E.P. Sanders' preferred anti-law gospel renders inauthentic any law emphasizing doctrines of Jesus in Matthew or Luke. That's the heading. Ed Parrish Sanders is a New Testament scholar known as, quote, the principal proponent of the new perspective on Paul, E.P. Sanders' Wikipedia. His perspective places Paul as dealing with contemporary issues of Judaism and whether its customs and laws made one superior versus Hellenistic customs and laws. Paul supposedly said the law did not have this effect, and Jews were not superior to Gentiles for obeying their Torah. In 1985, Sanders wrote that the Jesus of Matthew 23, who excoriates the Pharisees for not following the law enough, cannot possibly be the, quote, historical Jesus. Now, by the way, they're claiming we get rid of Paul. What's he doing? He's getting rid of Jesus. When he's Anything he says that's law-centric or the, the Pharisees he's teaching don't follow the law, they're they're disobedient. They they teach shallow version of, of, of the law, right? And so he can't take that. We don't want it more. Huh? We don't want it tightened up. We want it looser, looser, and gone. So he can't be the real Jesus. Now, why would that be? Because of Paul. Oh yeah. So he he solves the problem that that uh, Paul. It wasn't Paul that had. Excuse me. That Paul. Uh, didn't really bring something new. It was never in Jesus's. Uh, it was in, in Jesus. And, and it was Matthew who's the liar, and the corruptors are all the four, you know, the Gospels here. Uh, these are not truly Jesus' words. Why? Obviously because they conflict with Paul's view of the Pharisees as legalists. When Jesus says they are not, but too lax, that's what Matthew 23, verse 23 says, that the Pharisees are too lax about the law. That's another myth that Jesus is saying they're, they're too excessive. No, no, they're too lax. Jesus says they teach tithing, but they neglect to teach the law of what? Mercy? which is in Exodus 20, verse 6. If you want mercy, what do you have to do? Jesus, God says you have to love me and obey my commandments, and you'll get mercy. Repentance is what's necessary, in other words. So, and then he says that you don't teach the judgments of the law. And what were those? Those are in the the, uh, the Exodus covenant code of uh, Exodus 21, 22, 23, the three chapters that follow the law, the judgment sections. And then he says, you don't teach pistis, which could be obedience, faithfulness, or could be faith. So three things they don't teach, the Pharisees don't teach. So they're not good teachers. Here are Sanders' words. As I argued in the preceding chapter, the Jesus of Matthew 23, verses 5 to 7, 23 to 26, is not the historical Jesus. So anybody tells me we're taking Jesus out of the Bible, look what they're doing. They're taking Jesus out of the Bible. I mean, excuse me, that we're taking Paul out of the Bible. They're taking Jesus out of the Bible. Who's more important, Jesus or Paul? I digress. He is one who objects to the Pharisees because they are not righteous enough, and he favors a higher righteousness according to the law. My goodness, that's terrible. While not denying any of the law, even its minutia. See also Matthew 5, verse 17 to 20, 43 to 8, chapter 6, it looks like. Oh, no, no, wait. Yes, chapter 6, verses 1 to 8, and verses 16 to 18. Further, the charges of Matthew 23 are related to the use of tax collector, a tax collector to mean outsider, which I take not to be an authentic saying of Jesus. So he's he's now erased two. Actually, I guess he's erased all those verses he cited there already. He cited he's gotten rid of a lot. Why don't people why don't people get upset with Sanders that he's taking words of Jesus out of the Bible, saying they don't apply? He'll he'll, he'll keep Paul all day long, but Jesus we got to get rid of. So this is their other attack. They they attack the validity of principles. There's no there's no manuscript issue for this. This is just simply he doesn't match what he Sanders uh, imagines Jesus should really be talking about. Okay, we can we can be certain that Jesus did not use tax collector as is used in Matthew five forty six, and this counts against the authenticity of the passage on the hypocrites. Okay, so. Yeah, there's some ridiculous argument that tax collector is a way of saying an outsider. How do you know that? <laughs> it's just this made up stuff. And then they use that to say, well, then Jesus couldn't have talked about outsiders as tax collectors. So you, 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 they make a straw man. They make a, a phony argument and then they knock it down and then we lose 
the message of Jesus. Okay, and and then he it concludes here, and consequently, it's against the authenticity of the charges against the Pharisees of Matthew twenty three. Okay, so he wants the Pharisees who are low teach very low about the law to be gone, uh, uh, to to not be a problem. That teaching low versions of the law is a good thing. Hence, Sanders simply eliminates any emphasis. This is me talking. Uh, let me just back up here. This is in E.P. Sanders' book, Jesus and Judaism, Fortress Press, 1985, at 277. I got that from a link online from books.google.com, and you could click the link there in this article, which is called Paulinism Examples, and you can watch, look at the page. Hence, Sanders simply eliminates any emphasis by Jesus upon righteousness from the law because it does not fit Paul's view that the Pharisees were strict in obeying the law. By the way, no one can dispute this. Is What Jesus is saying is the same thing that God always said. And you can't contradict God, right, on how to be saved. Jesus can't come and teach a different gospel than God, that God gave, right? That's apostasy. So he knows that. He can't do that. And he's teaching the Jews what they have to do. So this whole idea of Mr. Sanders is insane in the sense that it's not possible that you can imagine you can eliminate Jesus because he's agreeing with the law and prophets. It's only if Jesus came teaching against the law and prophets you would consider that be to be inadmissible and because it's violating God's principles. So it's just, it's, he's got it totally backwards. What he's really doing is making Paul a demigod. So we, we are, we must be attracted and follow whatever Paul says, no matter how many laws it breaks, no matter how much, however much of the Mosaic code it violates and will be uh, apostatizing against. No, no, no. We have to keep Paul at all costs. And then Jesus is just simply irrelevant now on doctrinal grounds. And we're rejecting anything he says that's contrary to the doctrines of Paul. That's what's really going on here. All right. Um, I'm just going to skip over here to get to the end here. We're going to take a break. All right. Carl Stang, Lutheran who Paulinizes Jesus' message. Carl Stang wrote an influential article in 1924 entitled Zur Ethik der Berg I can't speak German. Zeitreift vor Who knows what that is? The Paulinizing aspect of this are summarized in an article entitled Carl Stang, Lutheran Paulinizing of Jesus' Message. So that's what I read. An English, <laughs> an English speaker uh, did a book on this. It can be found inside of Clarence Bauman's book, The Sermon on the Mount, Its Modern Quest for Meaning, at page 177. And um, this is um, what he says. One of the quotes Bauman cites from Stang is as follows. Fellowship with God is not achieved through ethical performance. So I guess when Exodus 20, verse 6 says, if you need mercy, you need to love me and obey my commandments, just doesn't apply, I guess. From an ethical standpoint, it is a derogation of the idea of the good to seek its realization by imitating Jesus. So if you, in other words, what he's saying there, if you try to imitate Jesus, you're taking something away from the whole idea of goodness. Why is that? Let's listen. The teaching about the ideal only serves to make plain the reprehensibility of the human condition. Oh, I see. So if we look at Jesus and we're trying to imitate him, that's just, that's seeing the only reason Jesus is such a good person is so that we would feel how reprehensible we are as human beings and, and we can never achieve the kind of life or the behavior of Jesus. And so it's just, just don't even go there. Don't try to emulate Jesus. Don't try to follow his example. It's just not going to work. It's just going to be, you just have to look at him and just feel how reprehensible you are. The meaning of the moral demand is not that it gives us the power for the good. Again, so you don't need to, to feel motivated by Jesus' example, to try to live like Jesus teaches and gives an example. Instead, he says, the moral demand is this, but rather that it shows our impotence for the good. Wow. So the only reason to look at Jesus is to say, oh, there's just no way I can do that. Oh, that's just so impossible. He's nice to women. He treats women with respect. He, he is wise. He, has, uh, he motivates people to follow God. You know, I could never do that. That's just, I'm just a despicable person. This is insanity. I mean, to me, this is just garbage. Garbage, Mr. Stang from 1924. Okay. Now, here's the commentary I make on that. Stang is thus deliberately saying Jesus is not an example to imitate. Such effort would supposedly derogate the very notion of what it means to be good. And any of Jesus' commands to be good were not intended to incite obedience, but rather the realization of our weakness that we can never truly obey God. 
This is solely derived from Paul being superimposed on Jesus' words. Prof Professor Bauman now makes a comment. Pr Professor Bauman aptly summarizes the message of Stang. Stang's central axiom is derived not from Jesus, but from Paul, and reflects not the contents of the Sermon on the Mount, but the influence of Rever Reformation dogma. Stang made claims about the Sermon on the Mount, which its, which its content does not validate. He read into it theories and experiences foreign to its sphere. Stang's misinterpretation of the Sermon on the Mount exemplifies the characteristically Lutheran hermeneutical incongruity of superimposing upon the teaching of Jesus, the theology of Paul, Bauman at 185. So I hope we see there that there's some scholars who just tell the truth, that what you're doing, Mr. Stang, is you are superimposing Paul over Jesus and, and erasing anything. You're, you're, you're erasing out the lines of anything that Jesus says that's different than Paul, so that you ultimately only have Paul. This is Marcionism recreated.